But were there ever any unpleasant moments surrounding your disabilities? Has anyone said something not very friendly to you? Uh, once I disclosed my disability, or I used a wheelchair, the employer said, "Oh, Mr. Key, are you? So if you have disability, uh, we are not hiring people with disability right now. So we are sorry." Welcome to Proudly Asian, a podcast series that tells bold and proud stories of Asians by Asians. I'm Isabel Wong, a financial journalist who wants to uncover the many Asian stories around us that are waiting to be told. There's never just one way to look at Asians. This podcast will take you through a deep dive into the life stories, struggles, and triumphs of young Asians around the world. On today's episode, we have Mizuki Su, a Japanese diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner who was born and raised in Kyoto. Mizuki lost the ability to walk when she was two years old and subsequently began using a wheelchair. She talks to us about her passion to promote equal employment opportunities for people with disabilities, biases she has overcome, and how DEI can be effectively integrated into global businesses. Welcome back to Proudly Asian. For March this month, we are once again doing an International Women's Day special series, chatting with women from around the world who are breaking all forms of biases and driving the world to embrace equity, which is also the theme of IWD International Women's Day this year: embrace equity. And for this episode, we are bringing in a guest who works in the domain of diversity, equity, and inclusion herself from Japan. Welcome to Proudly Asian, Mizuki. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Hi,、um, my name is Mizuki Su.、Uh, my pronoun is she, her.、Uh, I'm diversity, equity, inclusion, so DEI practitioner and business. I'm also a writer and public speaker. And then I was born and grew up in Kyoto, Japan, and I'm now based in Tokyo. This Rachel, you know, before we get started with hearing all about the important work that you do in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how companies can really implement DNI strategies, I would like to know more about you. So, why don't we start with talking about your background? Who are you? What are you? And where did you grow up, Mizuki? Yeah, so、um, so I grew up in Kyoto, so which is the west side of Japan.、Um, So you probably have been there or have heard about the city. So I grew up there,、um, and then I was born、uh, without disability.、Uh, but、uh, the reason I started my career as a,、uh, a DI practitioner is very, very connected、uh, how my、um, mobility disability、uh, came,、uh, and I grew up with that. So since I had um, um, since when I was two years old, I have a disability, mobility disability, and then. When I realized that I'm just like myself, the、so、two years are too small, so I don't really remember. But uh, uh, I start using wheelchair. But um, so I believe my parents are very, very shocked or upset. And then, but fortunately, my both parents are very, very advocate for me. So really wanted to. They really want me to have like a real, like a like an ordinary kid's life. So my parents were strong, a、uh, uh, strong advocate for me to access for general education in the community、uh, in the the area I grew up, and they let me experience almost everything. So that's me. And then、uh, when I was a child, I didn't really、um, had a big challenges, but.、Uh, Uh, the city I grew up in Kyoto is kind of old beauty city, so it's not always accessible by wheelchair. So as a student, I was I saw I was having like a very like a normal life, but at the same time I had always had like a, like physical accessibility uh, uh, challenges. So that's really a、uh, chance to think about what can I do for more things are accessible and how I can support other people with disability, etc. Mm -hmm. Following up on you know your story because you mentioned you lost your ability to walk at the age of two and then eventually you started living in a wheelchair at the age of seven right、yep. you did mention your parents were really strong advocate for you to have a normal life as a child but back then as a child did you ever think you were different or were you treated differently by other schoolmates? That's a great question. Ah,、uh, to be honest, um, since 
when I realized I'm just myself. And then I was always surrounded by people without disability, well, kids without disability at classroom. So I feel like more, uh, although there is like an accessibility challenge, um, other thing is the people are more, um, I think treat me so equally and then gave, gave me a lot of like opportunities. So I didn't really feel that uh, when I was younger. And then I think I start realize that I'm a little bit different than others. Maybe at the age of 12, 13, 14, they could start in thinking about future or like, um, uh, and then because a lot of kids, as you may ask other kids that, what do you want to be in the future? What kind of job do you want to get? But uh, when I was younger, I feel like I feel like I can do anything like other kids. But so I say whatever I want to do. But uh, when I grew up, I feel like um, because I haven't seen other people in wheelchair in the community. So I don't know if I can do this job, do this job in the wheelchair as a wheelchair users. So I started thinking about, oh, I'm a little bit different. And then some uh, some jobs that require like a standing up style. Like uh, when I was younger, I want to be like a hairstylist. But I have seen all the, I never seen like hairstylists in a wheelchair. And then uh, one day I also want to be, I'm interested to become actor, but I never seen the actor in the wheelchair. Maybe there are uh, in the world now, but uh, when I was younger, uh, I never seen before in the, in the TV or like a movie. Uh, so I feel like mm, maybe I cannot. And then so I just realized that things are, there are things that I cannot do by wheelchair. So I think in that junior high school, high school, I think it's more like um worry about my future. What can I, what, what can I do in the future for living? So that's something started thinking about, um, I'm different. Also another thing besides job, like a professional career, uh, I think around high school, my close friends started dating someone, but I never seen that like, uh, a person in the wheelchair having someone uh, like going out a date or like having a becoming mom or like a dad, like raising kids. So I think they got uh, those like a relationship thing is also something I'm studying kind of worry about. Can I have a boyfriend or like, would I get a married or have, even have a kid afterwards? Because I never seen those like a role model in my community. Yeah, and I know you're a mom also, yeah. and I'm so glad that more kids maybe with disabilities can see you as a role model, as an example, because they now have someone to look up to uh -huh. and see, oh, that's actually possible for Mizuki. So you're definitely a role model, a great example for a lot of kids with disabilities currently. But I mean, growing up, you do have a very positive attitude towards your physical abilities and disabilities. But were there ever any unpleasant moments surrounding your disabilities has anyone said something not very friendly to you that kind of stuck with you yeah um when i was student i don't really i didn't really have that moment to be honest it was a really great experience so friends are nice and teachers are very supportive so i would say the unpleasant moment was uh so i went to i wasn't i live in kyoto until high school and i went to college uh I went to uh, U.S. for college, so so I feel more like uh, equal opportunity, equity for almost everything. That I, well, physical accessible, accessibility was really great in the U.S., but as a wheelchair user. So, and then after graduation, I came back to Japan for job hunting to, to start my career. So until the time, I didn't really know about what the like, employment uh, system for people with disability in Japan or anything. But uh, um, so I feel like, uh, so Japan has a quota system for people with disabilities employment. So currently it's 2.3% for private entities. A uh, good thing about quota is like um, governments still protect uh, a working opportunity for people with disability. But uh, the real challenge I faced was like uh, disability inclusion after uh, join uh, the company or em uh, employer was a really different story. So. I see more employers like um, doing this like a quota, using this quota system as like a checkbox. So once they hire, it, that's it. So I face a little a real challenge is like um, so I have all the educations, but when I dis since my disability is visible, I use the wheelchair. So when I apply for a job, um, so a lot of case employers say, oh, okay, uh, let's have an interview. And then I disclose that, oh, I use wheelchair. So just want to give you a heads up so that you won't surprise. And I just also want to make sure that 
office or building is accessible so that I get really access to like in-person meeting, uh, interview. Uh, but uh, once I disclosed my disability or I used wheelchair, the employer said, oh, Mr. Key, are you, uh, so if you have disability, uh, we are not hiring people with disability right now, so we are sorry. Or um, the 80% of them, like they just pull the door and then uh, I cannot really move to the next level. Uh, and then another thing is like they still want to have like a job interview, but not regular job, but the one for the job, the, the job that they created uh, especially for people with disabilities. So which is like a lower expectation, less uh, responsibilities and then lower salary and the usually contract base, a bit very different um, job sheet. Um, uh, set up compared with uh, the one for people without disabilities. So I feel like, uh, well, I had all the education. So, and then although it's a new grad student, I don't really have like a work experience yet, but uh, compared with other new grad students in Japan or US, I think I can do many other jobs, but um, they think, oh, you have disability and then this job is like a dangerous for wheelchair users. So why don't you try this like a uh, admin work, for example. So I feel like uh, you are not really seeing me, but you are seeing me like a, one of the people with disabilities. So it's really difficult to um, kind of have a conversation or like a negotiate with them that I can do this job. As long as it's like a desk work, I can try. It's not, if it's a required like a running or like a need to go up and down stairs, I may not be able to like um, do the job, but otherwise like uh, I could try at least, but they say like, oh, it's dangerous or like uh, this is not designed for people with disabilities. And then, so it's a really, um, a lot of cases they don't really see me as a candidate, but they see me as a person with disability. So that's a uh, real challenge um, and then unpleasant moment. But now I feel like uh, because of the experience, I uh, could find my career as a DA um, practitioner now. So I think that's also, I would say it's not really bad thing. Yeah. And I mean, what stuck with me was that when you mentioned um, how when you submitted your job applications and you mentioned you live in a wheelchair and people would respond to you like, we are not really hiring people with disabilities at the moment as if it's like right. there's a very special time right. for when they hire people with disabilities, right? If the company or employer doesn't really hire anyone, I will understand. But if they open up other job role and why not? And then that really means that they just want to meet the quota mm -hmm. uh, for the people with disability. And if they have enough number of people with disabilities, they don't want any more. So I think it's uh, it's really interesting how they approach. But after I having those conversations with so many employers, I realized that that's not that on. There are a lot of employers that in the working on the, those quota system. And then um, another thing is like so the um, even I could uh, go to the interview stage. Uh, it was very interesting and I saw it's normal to, as a Japanese person. But so in Japan, uh, for people with disability, we have like a um, disabilities, um, like an ID or booklet. It's a, this size of uh, thing that I, there's a disability type and then my picture and then all the information as in a booklet. So uh, the employer is uh, collecting those a copy of the booklet, the disability booklet, so that they can collect how many uh, people with disability they hire, and then they can report to the government. So it was interesting that even uh, at the interview stage, so I don't know if I can get the job or not, employer asked me to submit a copy of disability a certificate or a booklet in advance to make sure that I have disability. And then, and then the, even during the interview, uh, what kind of disability you have and how often I need to go to see a doctor, uh, that is not really related to the job uh, that I'm applying for. So I think I would say now it's, I, I believe it's getting better and better and a more equitable process for people with disabilities. Uh, hiring, but now uh, that, 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 that time was really, really, I feel like, but uh, to me, I really want to get a job. So I just disclosed whatever they ask. But afterwards, I uh, became a researcher to uh, in the US to research about the employment for people with disabilities equity. 
And then U.S. has very different uh, regulation and law for people with disabilities employment. So I feel like, oh, what I did all for Japan and in Japan was some things are very illegal in the in a different other con- country. So I feel like um, something. Um, I think a lot of employees in Japan want to make sure that everything is right and that everything they know uh, in advance so that they can prepare and they can also report. Uh, but at the same time, for people with disability who want to find a job, I think that it's not equi- equitable or equal, equal opportunity because by sharing those information in other bus, that may create additional bias or like, oh, this candidate may cost more when they hire or something. So I think it's not really uh, equitable in the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are definitely pros and cons mm, yes, with yes, that yes. quota system because I saw people were saying that, of course, it could incentivize employers to hire more employees with disabilities. So that means more job opportunities for them. Yeah. Right? But at the same time, it might actually make them emphasize on like, oh, who are the employees with easier disabilities? Yeah. So they don't have to pay so much money to do accessible yeah. facilities or adaptations. So for those with so-called easier disabilities, then they will become favorites, right? Because employers don't have to spend so much money on adapting to them. And like you mentioned during the job interview stage, from there, I learned that the biggest challenge would be pretty much around people with disabilities having that barriers or having to go through that very long process to prove to people that, hey, despite the disabilities, I still think like a normal person. I still have the same level of intelligence. So there are a lot of that kind of biases, but I know that you have um, lived in the US and now you work in Japan. So, you know, like compared to other countries that you have been to, you have lived in, how is Japan doing in terms of accessibility and overall attitude towards people with disabilities because I remember reading some of your online posts you were highlighting your experience as a person with disabilities in Japan like you had challenges around finding a nursery that would be accessible to you or you even talked about your experience with Shinkansen and also an onsen hotel so how is Japan doing in that sense? Yeah um as a wheelchair user I think um what Depending on the city, because Japan, although it's a small country, uh, depending on the city, like a big city has more accessibility features, uh, but a more countryside, maybe less. So I have lived in the U.S. Uh, total three years and then have visited as a traveling uh, for um, Australia, Taiwan, Singapore and Korea and Thailand and Canada as well. Uh, so compared with all the countries, uh, experience and then all the countries, I think Japan, uh, in big city, I think I would say the getting better and better. And then especially uh, in 2021, there was a Paralympic Olympic game here. So I think accessibility was really, really improved. Um, but uh, it's also there are many old buildings uh, that is a lot of stairs or like a big steps. And then uh, there are many, many shops and uh, things are not really yet uh, accessible as a wheelchair user but uh, things are getting better in the big city in Tokyo or Osaka but uh, when I go to countryside I see less people with disabilities out there and then uh, there are less um, accessible feet uh, the equipment so it's more difficult to travel or like go see uh, places uh, independently so uh, the nursery uh, was the story like, uh, so I have two kids uh, and then when I tried, so I was working before I had kids and then uh, took like a parental leave one year and uh, to, to go back to work, I need to find uh, like a daycare, like a nursery. But at the same time, it was before COVID. So my, my husband and myself have to go to office and then, uh, so I really need to, um, be responsible to pick my kid up after work and then so my husband come up, come home a little bit late so that's our strategy so but it, to do so i need to find a wheelchair accessible a daycare that i can pick pick my sis, my daughter up by myself so there are many daycares in the community i live but uh so i visit uh one by one but uh, there are uh the stairs or the very steep hills or there is a gun um, attached, like a lift, but uh, I think 
I assume that I always need to call the daycare to move, to, to operate the lift. Uh, so I cannot really go pick, pick my kid up uh, independently. So there was, uh, I think more than 10 nursery around here within walking distance, but only one nursery is fully accessible. It's all flat and I can go to the classroom by, by wheelchair without asking uh, for any help. So, um, so it's really, really difficult to find. Uh, but uh, so I'm so lucky that I can uh, get a spot for in that in the daycare. But otherwise, it's really impossible to go back to work. Or like maybe my husband need to like uh, short time his work uh, hours. Or like need to figure out something else. But it was really difficult. And then uh, for Shinkansen also. There is a, like a spot that wheelchair accessible area, but uh, the booking system is really uh, not easy to do. And then uh, also um, uh, need to re uh, sometimes need to prove that I have disability. So I will, so that the disability certificate, that booklet is something I need to always carry. And then uh, when I really need to book that space, I need to show it and then uh, make sure that I have disability because I want. So that's why I need the space. So the booking is available, but the process is more like a little bit take, takes more time to do. So I think, um, um, now like, um, uh, Japanese government, uh, say like um, around like 7% of population in Japan has some kind of disabilities. So, um, um, but at the same time, still, um, I think in the, depending on the, uh, area, but I think we are still, uh, we can do so many more things to make things more accessible. Uh, so I think there is a momentum here. So I want to, con I want to continue the momentum, but otherwise it's really difficult that, uh, people, I think in the countryside, people are not there not out. So that's why the, com the, 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 all the infrastructure or like things are not accessible or things are not accessible. That's why people are not out there because there are, there should be people in the countryside or like other places. But um, uh, that's a that's a current st uh, stage in Japan. That's true. And for the booking system with Shinkansen, like people with disabilities cannot just hop on oh. and off the train. So they always have to plan ahead. So maybe some people in the countryside, they can't be bothered with the whole booking process. Yeah. And that might kind of limit their movement as well, right? So yep. you just mentioned a lot about as a woman living with disabilities in Japan, you know, all sorts of bias that you faced. Another bias I want to highlight in this episode is name bias because your husband is from Taiwan. So naturally you adopted his family name and I remember seeing an online post of you mentioning um, living in Japan with a non-Japanese name is not as easy as one would think so could you tell us more about that yeah that's a great question uh so in Japan about 98 percent of almost everyone uh is Japanese so very few are uh, foreigners uh the ratio so non-Japanese name is not well equipped in the system and people. And then uh, I would say the technical challenge is like, um, so some system, when I want to register my name in some, uh, I they, the system simply doesn't accept uh, the uh, non-Japanese name. So it's always keep error and error. So I need, I don't know what to do. And then uh, people assume that, always like people assume that you, everyone has Japanese name. Especially when I, mean, I when they see like a Japanese like Asian, so and then they if, and then especially they speak Japanese, uh, so I think um my my difficult like not too difficult but my like um, uh challenge is that every time when I want to make a reservation like a restaurant or like a place, uh they ask my name they ask my name uh and then I will say uh my name is Sue Mizuki also in in Japan in Japanese uh, family name for the my name is Sumizuki, and then and then they think like uh, they cannot really get uh, what is what is Sue, and then so they ask, uh, keep asking what what was that? So maybe the connection was bad, and then they just <laughs> keep asking, and then I will end it up uh, like, oh, this is not Japanese name, this is Taiwanese name, and they say, oh, okay, now my name Sue or so H S A U and the um, spelling, and then in kanji we use the kanji in Japanese too, but uh, Japanese people are told to call pronounce or read the kanji 
as a job instead of shoe. Mm-hmm. So a lot of kids, people read my name, Joe, Joe. And then for example, like a delivery person, they bring the package or the mail and then say like, oh, this is a package for you. You are Joe-san, right? And then, and then it, I'm not Joe, but I, I also understand that the Japanese people read it, the kanji as a Joe. So I think uh, in the first, I, at first I correct, uh, this is not a job, but this is, uh, is a two, but uh, I think I just getting tired of correcting the everyone's pronunciation because, uh, I understand that in Japanese, in Japanese education, we learn that kanji is to, uh, to read a job. So I think, um, there's something little thing, but uh, I think it's a really difficult. And then another thing is like, uh, I noticed the difference before and after I changed uh, my name that some people, not everyone, some t- people's behavior, like communication style is a little bit rude. Mm-hmm. I think if you, if the, uh, you are Japanese, if I know that you are a Japanese person who live in Japan, I think maybe you say like a respect, like in Japanese language, but there are like a several tone and then words to show your respect to someone elder or someone like important person or like that. also uh the tone also really describe how much we are closer together when people use like a more respect form for customers for example uh people usually use the most respect to respect tone to customers uh because they are not too close and then they are uh, how to say the posture is different. Uh, so, but uh, when I go there, for example, and then, uh, for example, I write my name in, um, in kanji and then the kanji is, we use the kanji, but uh, we don't use it for person's name. So people notice that this is no Japanese and then people assume that I'm not Japanese. So I think sometimes people's, uh, behave, how they communicate with me a little bit rude because they assume that I'm foreigner. Mm. And then I, when I say something, uh, like, uh, in Japanese, it's very foreign because I'm a Japanese native speaker. They notice that, oh, you are not, oh, you're Japanese. And then, and then they change their attitudes. So I feel a little bit weird that why you change your attitude toward Japanese person and then other, uh, non-Japanese person. So that's something I start feeling. Uh, not, but not everyone, but only some people. Mm-hmm. And did anyone ever question you? It's like, oh, why did you give up your Japanese name? Um, sometimes. Mm. Um, uh, but in Japan, um, well, I in my case, I married to a mm. foreigner, no non Japanese person, so I could keep my Japanese name. But uh, mm, I think maybe it's a, a Japanese thing. Mm. Uh, but um. Um, usually when, if I marry to a Japanese person, marry a Japanese person, I need to pick whether I keep, uh, as a couple, we need to decide one, uh, family name. In a lot of case, um, uh, the couple, a couple will choose like a, uh, husband side, a uh, family name. So it's still very common and only some case, uh, woman side. And then, uh, to getting married as an like, international marriage, I don't, I didn't really need to choose. I didn't really need to dis, uh, change my, I could keep my maiden name, but I, I want it, uh, because, um, uh, it's a very old oh, personal story, but I had a very long, uh, relationship, like eight years. And then, uh, we did like a long distance relationship. And then also we lived together for like four years in Tokyo. And then the timing we decided to get married is like, I got a opportunity go to go back to us as a researcher. Uh, but, um, he had a job, my husband had a job in Japan. So we have to like live separately. He stayed in Japan and I go to us for one year. So I feel like, so I, we decided to get married, but I, at the same time, if I don't change my name and then if I keep my maiden name, I couldn't really feel like oh that I get I got married so I want to remind myself that I'm we are together and then I need to come back here as a family as a couple and then another thing that like, uh, I wanted to have a, a kid in the future at the time and then uh if we live in Japan um it's, it's not still common to have um for example like uh, both parents have a different like a separate uh, name so as a family 
uh, most of people have like one uh, family name and then under it, their kids and then their kids also have the same family name. So that is maybe I'm too traditional person, but uh, having that one uh, family name is something I wanted. And then I also uh, anticipate that uh, living in Japan without Japanese name can, could be really challenging for especially for younger kids. I have seen the other like classmates who kept their like um uh, Chinese name or like, Korean name. I grew up in Kyoto, so a little bit more diverse. Uh, so there are classmates. Uh, their family came from China or like, Korea. So and then uh, even they have like um Japanese name. They some for some uh, classmates they school that oh, our family came from China. Or came uh, my grandparents came from Korea, and then. Uh, I also seen that some kids are buried because because of just that. So I feel like uh, uh, growing up with uh, a non Japanese name and in, uh, in Japan could be really challenging, especially when kids are not really don't really know about what that really means. So I feel like uh, instead of me asking my husband to change to a Japanese name. I wanted to, I really like my husband's name. And then so I wanted to change it so that we all have same family name. And then when, even when my kid in the future has some kind of difficult moments, I will say like, oh, I changed my name from my Japanese name to my real daddy's name because I think it's really cool. And then I really wanted to be two together. So that I think I want to really want to encourage uh, that, and also I want my kid to be proud of having the uh, part of her, part of my kids is really connected to Taiwan, not just Japan. We although we are in Japan, so that's something that I change for me, also for like my kids and my future kids. That's such a beautiful story, and I really love how when you're highlighting, you know, your husband's last name, you wrote that there will always be people and systems that continuously don't get your family name right. However, you choose to feel the joy in life and you want to focus on the special things that this unique name in Japan mm -hmm. could bring to you. Like you choose to, you know, feel and enjoy all the benefits that the Sue name uh -huh. comes with. So it's such a beautiful story. And Thanks. the next topic that I would like to talk to you about is of course your work as a DNI practitioner. So I want to ask you as someone who is based in Japan, you know, from your personal experience, right? What are some of the priorities in terms of DNI that you think Japan has to focus on? I think a lot of people probably know by now that Japan is still kind of relatively lacking in terms of the gender diversity or even cross culture understanding. Yeah, so I share a lot about um, person with disability, disability inclusion earlier. So I will say, like you mentioned, as a woman, uh, like gender equity as like um. Uh, it's really, really challenging. And then I um, notice even like uh, people around me that um, especially a uh, woman um, going to workforce is like depending on the way you live when the way the, the where you receive education. Uh, for example, if you grew up in K uh, Tokyo in a big city, it's more like a commonly like a go to like a higher education, like a college and they have a, like a job that uh, other like men not really, um, they can choose more uh, from more opportunities. But if you grew up in the countryside and maybe your parents' generation or, or grandparents' generation think, oh, you are a girl and then you don't really need to go to higher education. It's you, if you finish your high school, maybe you can start getting a job and work and support family. So that's something depending on where you are, I think those are mindset and then culture is so different. And then uh, after I myself also experienced uh, working um, in Tokyo, several companies, and then I had so many female, like a woman colleagues. And then when I was in my early career, but I noticed that especially when they get married and then after having a child, I think um, it's, um, a lot of folks, they come back, but they work as in a different role or like they shorten their as a short timer, work as a short timer. Because um, now we have experienced COVID. So I think that more flexible work 
uh, something a uh, Japanese company or like a uh, organization more um, use those like um uh, um how to say uh, system uh, they also they are more flexible. But before that, I think uh, going to office, going to workplace is like uh, something they have to do. That's something work uh, for many employers. So I think um, it's but so usually like a woman side uh, instead of men's side they shorten their work t uh, time work hours and then they so that they can go to daycare or like uh, pick pick kids up and then uh, cook for dinner and then feed them and then take bath together and then so I think a lot of cases women side need to change their working style or like a uh, I also have uh, some friend they were working in their area career but uh, once they had the kids they just became a uh, housewife so I would say if they really want to be or like we, we want to be a housewife or if we want to work in a different role or if they want to uh, shorten, uh, shorten their work hours, if their choice, I, I'm happy. But if they ended up choosing those because they had no choice, I feel like why always a woman's side need to change how they work, how to operate all the things by, the, by, by themselves. And then, um, although I think compared with other country, I think lack of support for uh, like childcare, like a daycare, are uh, really all always like a pack and they cannot really get the support. And then uh, there is um, there are nanny service or like a helper, and then things are available, but it's not always available, like affordable for like a use like almost every day. So I think even there are service, it's for most of the family, it's not really affordable to use like um, like a seven days, um, if even if they want to. Mm. That's something like a woman's uh, like equity is really the key. And then another thing is also you mentioned that uh, non Japanese of uh, um, uh, people uh, people who live in Japan. Uh, so I say like a ninety eight percent of population here is non -Jap uh, uh, Japanese people. So foreigners are a lot a lot minority so i face like a, like a lack of awareness or understanding and then also less opportunity for especially for foreigners who cannot really speak japanese language so i think um it's really need to think about i work for like a multinational company now and before so i feel less that because people are coming from different culture different con um uh, countries so I feel like, oh, they are diverse in that company. But uh, once I finish my work and then get outside, get out from the office, there are like very much Japanese uh, culture and Japanese language. So I feel like, um, I, I, be, I feel like this is something we need to really work on uh, to get better. Mm. I can probably imagine in multicultural workplaces, there could still be a lot of time spent on figuring out each other's culture, right? Because okay. I think I've heard maybe sometimes foreigners might make mistakes because they don't understand, oh, in Japanese culture, there are some practices and customs that are very important to Japanese people. Uh -huh. And then foreigners might make mistakes and they might be seen as rude. So I could imagine them must be a lot of like mingling of different cultures and people like making compromises or like adjusting their behaviors a lot yeah but i mean of course de and i it's not a completely new professional area but then in recent years it has really gained prominence right like a lot of workplaces are starting to realize de and i is something that's not optional they have to really do it as part of the business so I just want to know how you got started with working as a DNI practitioner. I will say um, the the story I shared as um, the the challenge I faced as a person with disability to get a job. It was that was like a moment like uh, I think I would say the first time that I really faced the challenge as a person with disability, and then. But I didn't know what I can do. So in my early career, I worked for several companies, but not really related to any DI work. I uh, work in a different industry, and then and then. But at the same time, I really wanted to do something for uh, to make more things that equitable or like more equal opportunity for people with disabilities. So I didn't have any idea. But I, if I cannot really do it in my work uh, environment. 
maybe I thought about maybe I could start something on my own. And then first I started like my own blog uh, in 2011. Uh, and then started sharing my story and experience and then uh, how I can build a bridge between people with and without disabilities. And then by doing that, I got more attention. And then also I started volunteer work uh, for NPO nonprofit, where I published like a free magazine for women with disability across Japan. So I was an editor for a couple of years. And then uh, the nonprofit good part as a, there are professional editor and like a photographers and then uh, all the things, they are professional, they are pros, but at the same time, they uh, have a lot of volunteer uh, who are affiliates of people with disabilities coming from different backgrounds. So they are, re they are real boys. They can, uh, they can create the contents that is really uh, needed by the reader who are the like, women with disabilities. There are a lot of like a, a relationship, like career or like all the things they got traveling. And then, so it was a really great time that I could meet other people with disabilities around same age in Tokyo. So that is something. So started blog and started like a nonprofit volunteer. And then, uh, so in my, I think third company, I was, uh, part of the team uh, who where does um, corporate social responsibility. So I think part of it is kind of related to diversity, equity, inclusion work. And then during the my like core work, I had a chance to meet other employees uh, with disability who work in different uh, offices in the different other countryside of Japan. So when I look uh, at what the current challenge and the opportunities, I noticed that so far I did like my advocate work. I could meet other people with disabilities through like a nonprofit volunteer work. I now and I really could meet people who are working in the same group company, but their work environment, their what they what they want to do is very different and very diverse. So I feel like I really want to focus on this like employment of people with disabilities topic because at the time I had so many different projects as a corporate social responsibility team. I did something for environment, something for the community, something for the, like, a, I don't know, other things. So I feel like, oh, I really want to focus on employment of people with disabilities. And then I was, as, as, as the time I also thinking about, I, should I go to graduate school or should I change my job just to, that I can focus on this topic. And then I found that I got um, funded by uh, Daskin Ainoa Foundation, which is a Japanese org uh, organization where support uh, like a leaders with disability who wanted to go study abroad. So, and then that was like a fellowship for one year so that I got applied and I got a fund. Uh, and so I went back to US uh, to do the research about the topic. So um, my first challenge as a jump hunter, uh, as a people with disability was like, like finding, uh, I think that experience let me, uh, find my way to what I can do as a person who can, uh, advocate for the community. And then I also could meet other people who are facing similar uh, challenges. And then, so I ended up becoming, I uh, became a researcher. Then at that time, I was very focusing on comparing uh, U.S. and Japan employment uh, employment for people with disability, uh, and then came back to Japan after research. And then um, my focus as a next step was to go for a graduate school in Tokyo and the publish uh, publish a uh, research paper based on what I learned in the U.S. so that I could help other professors and the other. Um, people who really want to improve the people with disabilities equity, mm -hmm. equitable uh, employment. Um, and then interesting is like I, that was the time that I had no job after college. So I always work, 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 work. I never had a time that I didn't work. So I feel like um, I was accepted by a graduate school in Tokyo, but I, I had like a five, six months, like a, free time until the school start. So I feel like, um, I wanted to work even like as a short time to, uh, leverage my knowledge and information that I got in the U S. So I apply for, I reach out to the company. I already had a connection from the, my research. And then I ended up joining Google 
And then, and then the team was a APAC diversity, equity, inclusion team. And then that really made me expand my possibility and their capability as not just uh, employment, employment for people with disability in Japan, but a much wider markets and then not oh, including other underrepresented community like women, LGBTQ+, other race and ethnicity. So I think that is really turning point in my career. Mm-hmm. And I just want to get your point of view as a professional DNI practitioner who has implemented DNI strategies for multiple international organizations, right? You know, what really is an effective set of DNI strategies because a lot of people they might think oh so diversity you mean like oh um if you want to have boost the representation of women here you go we have 10% of women <laughs> or like here you go we have black people as our chief diversity and DNI officer right but then these could come off as tick box exercise yep. but from the professional point of view of a DNI practitioner have you seen any examples of the best practices or like really effective DNI strategies? I think um, uh, it's uh, really important to make the strategy that is like uh, equitable and sustainable and then beneficial for both employers and employees. And then uh, as like, as you also said, like uh, a lot of employers focusing on, uh, like they approach like a checkbox type, like a 10% or a like quota. So we uh, have enough numbers, so we are doing fine. But uh, it's really not really sustainable because um, once they have enough number, but if there is not really sustainable, like equitable process inside of the company, I think people leave sooner or later. And then that means that employees need to find more people to fill the gap, but they don't really do anything inside of the company. So it's, I think it's about cycle, conti- cycle continues. So I think having like equity, like, uh, and then sustainability, and then a uh, bit of benefit for both sides. And once, uh, I think it's really important that uh, employers keep saying that we are hiring and we are doing, uh, try, uh, making the effort to make that working environment, a workplace more accessible and inclusive, I think uh, that's that also really need to do. But at the same time, uh, once the inside of the the employee in, like workplace or like a working environment that really beneficial for employees, I think they will stay and then they will continuously um, try to uh, contribute to the business and how also there is, if there is any like a development uh, area that they can try, I think they will, they want to stay, they want to grow in the, in the corporate, in the, in the employers. But otherwise, I think it's really, really difficult to maintain and uh, retain those like uh, talented folks because those talented qualified uh, candidates are really limited. So a lot of employers want to want to hire those, uh, but it's really difficult. My approach, uh, what I have doing is like um, really working with a uh, functional like a leadership, like uh, involve, I uh, work with them. And then uh, a lot of case, uh, not uh, only for Japanese company, but other multinational company, their real challenge and my challenge as well is like uh, those DI work is uh, oftentimes uh, seen as like extracurricular by HR. Uh, so like a business side is like, oh, this is something HR is doing. And then I think we do this because HR is asking to do. But uh, DNI is like, uh, as you mentioned, it's a really, really like a tool, great tool to uh, like um, accelerate business overall. So uh, I think from the strategy building stage, maybe uh, my suggestion is a good, because the DEI field is so diverse. There are many things that they can do. It's really, really important to define, define and then identify what the current challenge is and what the areas. And then after the narrowing down the areas, I think really need to work with the business leaders and then they commit to move this forward from their uh, ownership, not really EDI person to drive everything. Once they could incorporate those like a strategy, like a focus area into their business strategy, 
I see it's much easier that, and then because they have that, well, this is a really related to their day-to-day -day work. It's not like an HR person asking me to do. So I think it's more uh, like awareness and then their involvement and the engagement uh, much, much better instead of HR, like a DI person to do plan everything for them uh, as it looks like an extracurricular. Yeah, I totally agree. It's like a lot of businesses would still see DNI and as, oh, that's the job of HR. Um, it really does not fall into the areas of the main business itself. But really, DNI has to be incorporated into the day-to-day -day activities, the core you know, business or even the products that they are selling, right? But then very quickly, I just want to zoom in on colleagues with disabilities. As someone who has a form of disabilities, what do you think will be the do's and don'ts? What will be the advice that you can give for Perfect. colleagues to be supportive allies to people they work with who might have disabilities? That's a great question. And then uh, even disability is like one word. Disabilities are very diverse. And then uh, a lot of people maybe already, uh, I would say people are already aware that uh, some disabilities are very visible. Like myself, I use wheelchair. So, but some um, disabilities are invisible. So it's really hard to find out until you talk or like communicate. So I feel um, like do is like a, I, before you really act or like reach out to the person, check your bias because everyone with disability is different even when they look the same. So even if you see a wheelchair user, myself or someone else, how I uh, receive, how I got a disability, how I do day-to-day -day work and how I manage things uh, by myself when I get a support, it's very different than other wheelchair users. So I think uh, you need to check your bias. It's my my comment or like my uh, question is like any bias, but yeah, that's something, uh, check your bias. And then uh, don'ts is like, uh, I feel, mm, don't assume that everyone with disabilities are open to share about their disabilities and why they live with disabilities. So what I noticed is like, um, so I was born without disabilities, but I had a disability when I was two. So I feel like I pretty much grew up with disabilities. So I'm very, uh, very natural to talk about my disability and because I, I'm like this always, almost always, but, uh, um, very, everyone's different. And then I noticed like, um, uh, some people, for example, who um, still remember the day that they are able-bodied. So there are the time that they could do almost everything by themselves, but now they have disability and then they cannot, they need ask for help to do something. So um, I think depending on the person, and then each person is different as I, I just shared earlier. So even if they got disability very recently, they may be open, very open to share their story. So, but it's really depending on the person. So yeah. I really encourage you to speak with respect at first and then seek how you can support uh, as a colleague. Otherwise, it's uh, really people. I, I have seen some like rude people just suddenly ask um, what I, what's the condition and everything. But usually uh, people, uh, once they're closer, they want to open a little by little. But uh, just don't assume that everyone is happy to share their disability, how they got a disability. That's a great advice. And I also learned along the way that sometimes people don't prefer to be addressed as a disabled person, but a person uh. with disabilities. So these are some of, of the language that people have to be mindful of. And also people would tend to see disabilities first before yes. abilities, right? But then we need to to, you know, flip it. Yes. You know, see the abilities before you see disabilities. In the English, yeah, uh, there are two ideas, like a people first or like identity first. So uh, I, my case, I to be called, uh, I'm okay with uh, both ways to be called. I'm okay to be called like a disabled person or a person with disabilities. But as an independent person, they have preference. And then uh, in Japanese language, there is like a kanji, uh, it's, uh, in Japanese, it's called shogai shat in kanji. Uh, but uh, there are some uh, discussion that the the in the there are three kanji, three characters. But uh, the middle one means like a uh, harm, and then, uh, it's not really a good word. So there are some discussion to make the kanji to hiragana, not to use really 
because the, the kanji itself like means harmful and then not um so it's not good uh means but to me i think i have seen those like kanji uh pe person with disabilities uh so i feel i'm so used to it but i think people are more to be inclusive because some people feel more uh not comfortable to see those uh kanji uh in mm. um so i think um there are a lot of conversation but depending on the person and then when I put those words in the corporate website or uh, any other like, material that in, everyone can see it, I I suggest to you not to use the kind of, because some people feel comp uncomfortable by seeing those words. But yeah, that's. But I think it's really, uh, if in the verbal communication, I think it's really good to ask the person if they are. Uh, okay or comfortable to be called this way or this that way yeah yeah for sure it's just like as simple as language it could change the perception of other people mm. and I know that sometimes people these days are more mindful about using more positive language because yes. using negative language might you know make people feel like oh disabilities is a really bad or negative thing mm. and then they start picking up a lot of negative biases but now it's time for us to move on to the next segment which is called Rapid bias. For this segment, I'll be asking my guests biased questions that they've got asked at some point in life. And for Mizuki's case, some biased questions that people might have for people with disabilities. So, Mizuki, are you ready? Okay. <laughs> Let's go. First question yep. If you are disabled, will your children be born with disabilities too? <laughs> Yeah, that's a I I think that's a very common question. Um so um, um most people with disability had a their condition after they are born like myself. So that means you may have disability tomorrow or one day in the future. So um it's, that question is not really true. And then I know some conditions may affect their child. But if it's not, no one can guarantee that your baby won't have any kind of disability. So um, when I had my first baby, I also worry about a lot. Uh, what if I, because I was not uh, born with disability, but I also just, especially for the first one, I'm very worried about uh, this uh, one. And then, but it's really, I was very fortunate that uh, at the time I had a colleagues in London uh, office that who had, a, uh, she also uh, was pregnant and she was, uh, low vision. She had a low vision. Um, so uh, she shared with me that um, so Mizuki, you don't need to worry about too much because compared with other parents, other people without disability, we already know how to navigate uh, this world with disabilities. And then even if we our if we if our child have a uh, disability, we are, we will be fine because we can be a very good role model. Uh, so I think we, it's a. Uh, because no one can tell that it's okay or like you are, your kids are fine or anything, but we are so ready. We are experienced. We have so much experience, and uh, and then uh, so we are our kids, even if they had uh, the disabilities, they are lucky to have us as a parent. That time I was crying in the BC, but I was like, um, um, it gave me uh, a lot of uh, good energy. Mm -hmm. And then when I had a second baby, I didn't really worry about too much about things, and then that I think that will be the way. So even if something happens, so I think just stay strong and focusing on what I can do. Oh, wow. That advice from your colleague in London, I mean, it kind of brought me to a little bit of tears. I mean, <laughs> I started get, getting a bit teary because it's such beautiful advice. Yes, but yes, yes, yes. The next question is, it's hard to find a qualified job candidate with disabilities. That's something I often hear. Um, I wouldn't say it's easy, it's super easy, but it just need more time to find ones because it's depending on the market or country, their education system and the accessibility and the, all the opportunities for people with disabilities are so different. So there are qualified candidates, but it's true that it's very small talent pool depending on the market. So I think it's really important that you show actively that you are hiring people with disabilities and then you provide reasonable accommodations from the interview stage and then after they hire they hire them 
And then they also offer equitable career development opportunities. And I also, because it's very limited, like a talented uh, pool is very small depending on the uh, the market, I highly encourage to connect with school, local school, disability organizations, and then build good pipelines continuously, not like a last minute. And then um, I think by doing so, uh, Meanwhile, also corporate like an employer need to really work on internally as well to create an inclusive environment, the workplace, like a physical accessibility and then employees mindset and the leaders mindset as well. And then uh, if uh, a lot of cases I have seen that multinational company have like employee resource groups for uh, it's like an employee red uh, community to celebrate all the diversity. And then they're usually like a woman community, like a people with disabilities community, LGBTQ plus class community. So if possible, I think that if there's a community as like a DRGs, I think that was also create the safe space for people with disabilities to just connect and then share their like a challenges or like opportunity within the community makes really help to re, uh, like stay in the corporate and then grow in there. And next one, Mizuki, your life must be tough. Well, oh, how much do you know about me? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think, but um, it's interesting that people say that uh, not not really recently, but when I was a child, especially, uh, people say to me directly. I still remember that they they come uh, elder person uh, tell me. Uh, told me this uh, like suddenly like when I was waiting for the like um, to cross the street so it's not always easy as a woman and then as a person with disabilities disabilities but uh, there are many people who can advocate for me and then support me and give opportunities so I feel like now my life is not really tough but I would say more than awesome I do what I, I what I do what I can do. Like I love uh, my professional work as a DF practitioner, and then I also love like personal advocate work like this. And then I have my lovely families and husband, my two kids. And then I also have a lot of abilities and then grow more. And then I also have I can I also could se- can secure my me time to do like um, like uh, go to massage or like do nail salons. A lot of case. Once they have a job or like uh, get married or have kids, the woman and them with disability don't really have that kind of opportunity to develop or enjoy their life as solo. I think it's uh, really my life is, I just say, I'm more than awesome. And finally, people with disabilities cannot work like normal people. I wonder if there are any normal people out there because everyone is so different and that everyone is not perfect and then everyone has strengths and weakness uh so i think um it's really really important to think about how we can create workplace or experience our world for wider range of people like how we can be more inclusive because everyone is different and then and then I think there are country by country, there are people, they decide what who is, what kind of conditions are disability or not disability. But I would say everyone is different and then that's true. So that's, we need to work on how we can include everyone mm-hmm. instead of you are disability, you have disability or this is not disability. Yeah. Yeah. And w- what does it even mean to be normal, right? Mm, uh, uh. But thank you so much for going through this rapid buys segment with us, Mizuki. Now, to end the episode, I just have two more questions for you. If you could give any advice to people who live with disabilities, what is it that you want to say to them? Yeah, um, I think even today, uh, there are less uh, representation of people with disabilities across the world, just not Asia. So sometimes you may feel like uh, less seen or like uh, less maybe valued or less respected. And then... And then I was, and then I um um, and then when I even especially when I was small, I feel that similar feeling because I have never seen uh, other 
uh, others like myself. So I would suggest you focus on yourself and then something I have been through, like uh, your interest or your passion and what you want to do. And then uh, I think by doing, focusing on yourself and then focus on what you want to do, I think those would re- lead to your next opportunities and then lead to people you should be connecting with to do a very awesome thing. And then always remember to uh, show your thankfulness and gratitude to people who support you because it's not, uh, it's very, very important to, and then it's, um, I think, uh, something I, I look back myself uh, in the past. I feel like, oh, I should thank for, I should be thankful more to my family, my parents, my siblings, and then my friends and my teachers. But something is really important to show your gratitude to so, they are helping you because they care about you. And then you also need to uh, say thank you or gratitude to them. Yeah, focus on what you already have in life. Mm. And the last question is, Mizuki, to you, what does it mean to be proudly Japanese? That's a great question. Um, I would say like um, being very thoughtful for others. Uh, like uh, Japan is uh, such a... Um, Japan people are populated, um, so 98% population are, are Japanese people and then they speak Japanese language. So sometimes it's not easy to accept or understand someone who looks different or who speak a different language or different perspectives. But uh, as a foundation in Japan, I think uh, we care about others and they listen well the others instead of like uh, speaking up or like act what I want and what I want to do. So I think uh, so being so full for others, the taking care of others is really, really, I feel proud as a Japanese person. And then just something I want to also uh, treasure and I want to improve as a Japanese person as well. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us, Mizuki. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Proudly Asian. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at proudly.asian for more content. We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Leave us a five-star review on wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in and signing off for now. I'm Isabel Wong.